Okay, we will pick it up in verse 12, Philippians chapter 2. I'll read down through verse 18. The words will be ahead of you on the screen. You can follow along as I read. Therefore, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God, without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and a twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Even, even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice, rejoice with me. We know that we've been looking at this book now for several uh, weeks, been listening to uh, the Apostle Paul as he speaks to this uh, dear loved church, the Philippians, but also listening to the Holy Spirit speak to our own lives today. And we have been reminded about the fact that life isn't always going to be about your happiness. God's more concerned about your joy. And that our joy can come through the Spirit-led what? Realization, understanding that all of our heartaches and hardships, all the, the aches and the pains can actually serve as an opportunity for the gospel to be advanced, for the gospel to go forward, for the kingdom of God to be advanced, and you and I can actually choose, just like Paul did, to rejoice in the midst of those things. Last week we were reminded that it's not like we, got a, we, we, like we hope for, we got a good chance of this, this whole Jesus thing being real, like we're just going to cross our fingers and, and really hope that maybe this Jesus thing is really going to, no, no, we, we were reminded last week, it is real, okay? And we learned what? Pay attention, get ready, don't be surprised, the day is coming when what? Every single knee will bow. We prepare for that. Every single tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We pondered that thought this past week. How are you doing? How are you personally doing with the realization and understanding that there is coming a day? Are you excited about that day? Are you terrified about that day? Are you confused? Like, really, what's it, like, what's it going to... Or are you indifferent? Yeah, well, I've heard a lot of stuff. Today, we can be reminded that God doesn't want us to be in a sense of kind of swirling confusion, but he has a clear word for us. And we see with some of the instruction that is given right here from the Apostle Paul to this group of believers. He begins, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed. And he talks about this, this term of affection my beloved, he, he knows, and we know that he has a special relationship with his brothers and sisters in Christ that are in Philippi. Paul speaks with this term of affection, but do you realize that it is God himself, the Holy Spirit of God, who speaks to you this morning with the same term of affection. God is saying to you, my beloved, you and I know that we loved, we love to be loved. There's something inside of us that draws us, that we want to be wanted. And God desires to have relationship with us. It's not only is Paul speaking to the Philippians, but what? The Holy Spirit is speaking to you and I. Uh, and he talks about the fact that what? He's commending them for their faithfulness. Philippians are, are a faithful 
body of believers. There's no, there's no criticism labeled to this church. There's no negative or, or construction or correction that is needed. But we know that in a sense, what he's commending them, that whether or not I'm there with you or whether or not I have been gone in my sustained absence, you've still been faithful. And he encourages them, he commends them, but I think like any great shepherd, any great pastor, he doesn't just, just commend their faithfulness, he actually challenges them to continue on. Challenges them, as we all need to be regularly, what? Encouraged and edified, built up in what? Our walk, but specifically in our work. That's what Paul does here. Three points I want to give to you this morning. The first one is this, and we have to learn to pay attention to the details when it comes to this text. Pay attention to the details. It uses this phrase here, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, if you just put those two words together, work out, work out, Automatically, there are some connotations that come, like we just think about working out. It's just something that we just don't want to do. You think about going to the gym or breaking a sweat or lifting weights. This is going to be hard. This is not meant for our enjoyment. It's meant for our good. Work out. We just don't like that. But it's necessary. It's needed. Work out, in addition, there seems to be some incredibly great misunderstanding to this text that somehow people confuse um, work out to actually mean work for your salvation. A lot of people on a quick read are like, oh, this means I have to, to work. Pay attention to the details here. You realize it doesn't take much. It may sound similar, but it doesn't take much for there to be completely two different meanings. I was, and I love this story, I've probably shared with you in the past, but how, how it only takes a tiny little detail. We miss something, and it heads us in two opposite directions. My, my friend is a rather old-fashioned lady, always very delicate and elegant in her language, And she and her husband were planning a week's vacation to Florida. And so she wrote to a particular campground that they would be camping at. And she asked for a reservation. And she wanted to make sure that the campground was fully equipped. But she didn't exactly know how to ask about the toilet facilities. And she couldn't bring herself to the place of actually writing the word toilet in the letter. So after much deliberation, she actually came up with a very kind of proper and old-fashioned term, the bathroom commode. But when she, she wrote that down in the letter, she still thought she was being a little too forward. And so she started over again. She wrote the whole letter over again and referred to the bathroom commode simply as the B. C. Does the campground have its own B. C. is what she actually wrote. Now, the campground owner received the letter, and he wasn't quite so old-fashioned, and he couldn't quite figure out what this woman was talking about. This whole B.C. really stumped him. After thinking about it, actually worrying about it for a while, he showed the letter to several campers, and they couldn't imagine what the lady was talking about. And so the campground owner finally coming to the conclusion that the lady must be asking about the location of the local Baptist church, the local B.C. And so she, he sat down and he wrote the following letter in reply to this woman. And he says this, dear, dear ma'am, I regret very much the delay in answering your letter, but I now take pleasure of informing you that a B.C. is located just nine miles north of the campground. It's capable of seating 250 people at one time. It's located in a beautiful pine grove and opened only on Sundays and Wednesdays. I do admit it is quite a distance away if you're in the habit of going regularly. But no doubt they will be pleased to know that a great number, you'll be pleased to know that a great number of people take their lunches and they just make a day of it. 
They usually arrive early and they stay late. My, my daughter met her husband in the BC. The last time my wife and I went was six years ago. It was so crowded we actually had to stand up the whole time. Sometimes it's so crowded that there's actually five to a seat. May interest you to know that right now there's a supper planned to raise money to buy more seats and they're going to hold it in in, in the basement of the BC. I would like to say it it pains me very much not to be able to go more regularly, (laughs) but it's surely not due to lack of desire on my part. As we grow older, it seems to be more of an effort, (laughs) particularly in cold weather. If you decide to come down to our campground, perhaps I could go with you for the first time. We could sit and introduce you to all the other folks. We will be sure to have a seat up in the front where you'll be seen by everyone. Remember. We are a friendly, friendly community. Best regards. You know, it, it kind of like it kind of sounds similar, doesn't it? BC and totally different meetings, totally, totally different directions. You know, it happens with this particular text before us. It sounds very similar: work out versus work for, but very, very considerably different. Let me remind you that scripture is explicitly clear on this subject. In Ephesians, Paul writes to the church at Ephesus in chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, he says this, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And he says, This is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works. Jesus says in John chapter 6, verse 44, No one can come unto me unless the Father himself who sent me draws him. So we know that salvation is not a work of ourselves, but yet we do also understand that there's an element of faith that is required on our parts. At some level, there is a degree, a role of responsibility that that you and I have, particularly when it comes to our what? To our sanctification, the process that God has called for us to be set apart, to be made holy. Acts chapter 16, verse 31, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. There's, There's effort at some point, at least in our own faith. What's interesting is that from the very earliest days of the church, there has been great debates. Do you believe that kind of like difference of opinions in local churches? I know that's a stretch for us. There's been great debate around the idea surrounding, is it, is it the power of God or is it the responsibility of believers when it comes to us living a faithful Christian life? Is it passive trust or is it active obedience? We know that salvation, without a shadow of a doubt, is what? Salvation is the act of God. But there still, at some level, is a degree of responsibility. Salvation is not by human works, yet it is always through our own personal faith. And so today, in a sense, we need to be reminded, what? That the working out of our sanctification is understanding the responsibility that we all have. The resources that we've been given to be obedient to what the Lord has called us to do. I love, I love the Old Testament example. The balance of this at a very intricate time in the history of the Israelites. Just following the the Passover, after what? The Lord Jesus Christ has miraculously granted them freedom from bondage in Egypt. We know that they escaped and literally it is recorded in Exodus chapter 14 verses 13 through 14 where where Israel has escaped, okay, and they're standing at the edge of the Red Sea and, and Moses gives very clear instruction here as you can hear what the pounding hoofbeats of the Egyptian horses and chariots that are chasing them. 
Moses gives clear instruction. He says this. Moses said to the people, fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, for which he works for you today. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silenced. Moses gives clear instruction. Watch the salvation of the Lord. You realize what the very next verse says? The very next verse, verses 15 and 16, say this. The Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. See the balance here? See the balance here? Salvation belongs to the Lord, and yet what? You can't just stand. God's going to call us to take that step. You see, miraculously, miraculously, Moses raises his staff. And God does an amazing work to save. So we have this balance before us. This command to keep on working out. That means making a sustained effort to bring us to completion, to ultimate fulfillment. This is a straining, a striving to be obedient and to be faithful. This is language that Paul, the Apostle Paul, repeatedly uses. He teaches the church at Corinth, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run, live in such a way that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath. But we, an imperishable. Paul says, I don't, I don't run aimlessly. I, I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body. I keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. And Paul knows very clearly the responsibility that God has laid on his own heart. And teaches all of us, all of us, we have a responsibility, what? To step forward. To choose. To do what is right. To live righteously every single day. That really boils down, I hate to say it. It's, it's the daily disciplines. It's that getting up and going to the gym when you don't want to. What's the daily disciplines? Fathers, husbands, it's you leading your home with this word every single day. Yeah, but, you know, it's been a busy day and we're just crazy. No, no. It's daily disciplines, time in the word. The day begins with it, the day ends with it. It's, what, it's the daily disciplines of what? We're, we're going to be faithful in our prayer time, in our prayer life. We're not going to skimp on this. The daily disciplines are what? Sincere. Sincere in our love for, not, for, for one another. Not kind of flippantly, yeah, I, I, got to do, I got to do this. I have to love him. No, to be sincere in that. To be sacrificial in our giving and in our serving. Giving to the place that we feel it. It it hurts us. If if we're going to give here, we're not going to be able to have something for ourselves over here. Time, money, whatever it is. That's the daily disciplines of choosing to live righteously. That's what it means to work out. Our salvation with what? And it says this, with fear and trembling. Something that we are losing in our culture today, if not lost entirely, is a healthy fear of God. It means that we, we walk and we talk with a reverential awe of who God is. A respect for the fact that God is ultimately holy and he calls us to do and to live holy lives praying diligently for god to to help us give give me the strength that only you can give to help me avoid sin and temptation in this life and not not lose sight when, when we work out our salvation with fear and trembling, don't lose sight of that picture that we had just last week of every single what knee bowing, every single tongue confessing. Keep in our minds these scenes from Scripture. Isaiah gives to us in Isaiah chapter 6, hold on to pictures like this. 
And so he had a dream. He says, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up. Don't lose sight. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Don't lose sight about what Isaiah says. He says, above him stood the seraphim and each had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, with two he flew and and one called to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook. The foundations shook at the voice of him who called and the house was filled with smoke. Don't lose sight of that picture from Isaiah chapter 6 or Revelation chapter 5. Where John has a vision, says what? Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, number myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Don't lose sight of those scenes. We keep them before us, what? So that we work out, we work out, even when we don't want to, even when we're exhausted, we work out with fear and trembling over who God is. So number one, we see what? We've got to pay attention. This is not work for. This is not work for salvation. doesn't work like that. Work out. Pay attention to the details. Number two, trust God to do the dirty work. I am not in any way, please, please, I am not in any way trying to be disrespectful or irreverent here. But, but it, is God who, it is God who sent his son to save you and his spirit to sanctify you. And we've got to learn to trust God to live every single day with this understanding. Not only do we work out, but it says, what else does it say? For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure we work out god works in we work out and god works in yes god does the work but we still need to trust him now we are creatures of extreme we we are and there's two dangerous and opposite extremes when it comes to both our salvation and our sanctification um, history has, has labeled them or called them, these are the two extremes. One I refer to as the quietists. The quietists are those that emphasize and stress God's role in sanctification to the virtual exclusion of any human effort. Just sit there quietly with arms folded and watch God make me amazingly holy. God has the ability to do that, but that's not what we're called to do. Just sit here, lock yourself in a room, we all like that, and just watch. And you just come out glowing. (laughs) Doesn't work like that. That's the one extreme, the quietest. The other extreme are referred to as what? History calls them or labels them the pietists. That is the emphasis and the stress of self-effort, self-reliance on what? Focusing on man's role in sanctification at the expense of any reliance upon God's power. This is where you just got to work harder. You're going to chain yourself to the monastery wall so that you will what? You can't, you can't move to do anything unholy, right? Right? There must be something I can do in order to make me holy. No, no, what, 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 what is this? They, they're both extremes. Thankfully, thankfully, by God's grace, the Holy Spirit gives to us verses like this before us this morning to help us, creatures of extreme, to avoid unbiblical heresy, unbiblical extremes. 
and thankfully present to every single one of us an accurate understanding, particularly of what biblical sanctification looks like in our own lives. Being set apart. So sanctified means being set apart for a specific work. God has called us to a purpose of being made holy because he is holy. You have, you have valuable uh, things in your home. What's valuable? Like a special uh, Christmas ball that you don't want broken. You, you take those ones and you don't hang them down low where the little kids are going to bite on them, right? But you put them up. You set them apart. You set them up high. That's the idea of what God is doing for us in his process of sanctification. He's setting us apart with purpose to be made holy. Paul writes what? It is God who works in you. In you. You mean he, he actually works in, this is a direct reference to what? The amazing work of the Holy Spirit of God who emphasis here is in you. Inside. Remember hearing and learning? Listening to the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ as he spoke to his disciples in the very last night that he was ministering before he, he was crucified. He's sitting in the upper room with his disciples right before his crucifixion, his resurrection. John chapter 13, he, 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 he washes, he literally scrubs the smelly feet of his disciples. John chapter 14, he says this, I, I'm going to go, but I'm going to, 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 as I go, I will give you another helper to be with you forever. And Jesus explains here, the world cannot receive him because it neither sees him or knows him. You know him. For he dwells with you and will be in you. Very specific here. By the time we get to John chapter 15, we know Jesus says what? Abide in me and I in you. There it is again. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, there it is, he it is that bears fruit, much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, you are of no value, of no use. Do you, do you see here, do you, do you hear the work of God in you? And, and being reminded that apart from God, sorry, it's, it's not, that you can do nothing. And yet there's still the responsibility to abide. That's a command. It says you need to abide. And thankfully, God gives us the means and the ability. Sovereign God of the entire universe is the source of our power that gives us the ability to abide. And the desire to abide. That's something born from within. I want, I want to have God working in my life. You understand that's what this is talking about. I read this week, the wonder of all wonders is that it is God who is at work in you. Just pause on that. He spoke everything in the entire universe into existence from nothing. That's a pretty impressive resume. It is God who works in you. Summarize perfectly. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 29, for this purpose also I labor, striving according to his power, which, which mightily works within me. Huh. And then thankfully, look at this, it's for his good pleasure. Since we are to think and do what pleases God, we can rest assured, we can trust that our actions will bring great enjoyment and satisfaction. The word is pleasure. You do Caius. It means that the Lord himself literally delights in our submissive obedience. Just like any father or any mother delights when our child or our grandchild chooses to 
be obedient. You're not, you're not twisting their arm. They're choosing. Dad, Dad, can I serve you? How can I do that? It delights us as a parent. Just like it brings what? Pleasure to God. Finally, he does what? He, he gives to us some things very, very practically. And I know what you're thinking. I, I, I do not have the time this morning to finish this. So this is by design. We're going to break it up into two parts. Okay, third point this morning is this, is that we're to shine as bright lights in a dark world. We're to shine as bright lights in a dark world because a sanctified life is God is calling us and is in the process of sanctifying us by our submissive obedience. A sanctified life will always stand out. Now, I'm a, I'm a practical, practical, simple, kind of black-white thinker. Yes, no, right, wrong. So I hear, okay, um, we are to work out. God is to work in. We understand what God is doing through this miraculous power. He gives us the ability to be submissive and obedient. We're submissive and obedient, and he delights, he pleasures in that. And I'm going to say, well, excuse me, help me out here. Specifically, like, what is it you want me to do? Right? That's a good question to ask. He gives to us three things. We're only going to look at one of them this morning. We'll look at the other two next week. Because we could spend a lot just on this one. Here's, here's what we are to do in order to shine as bright lights in a dark world. Okay, great question. So what do we do here? How do we, how do we figure this out? What's God going to give us the ability and the power to be obedient in? Here it is. Ready? Do all things without grumbling or disputing. Oh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I had the same reaction this week. Oh, so God, that's, that's really all you want me to do is just quit whining? The, the NIV translates it, do all things without grumbling and arguing. The old King James, I love this, to do all things without murmuring and disputing. And so I spent some time this week literally on these words. I just started with the first one. Okay, just, just examine uh, uh, by way of word study, look at the form, the tense of this word grumbling. This, this, this word, gangusmas, it even sounds like grumbling. It's a noun, genitive, plural, masculine, blah, blah, blah. What does that mean? I read commentaries. There's not a lot of, interesting, there's not a lot of arguing commentators here. Not on this particular one. It's pretty simple. By the way, this is the, I want to be able to understand this word clearly so I can teach it to you clearly. Right? That's kind of like what my job is. So this is the great summary of, of what it means to, to, to do all things without grumbling. Here's, here's the, the translation for us today. Quit whining. That's what it means. Quit complaining. That, that's, that's literally what it means. Quit muttering under your breath. I can't believe you just got That's a muttering. That's got goose moths. You say, well, really, come on. Who, who does that? Quit, quit what? Arguing, trying to plead your case. How many times do we hear this? Yeah, that's just not fair. It's just not fair. Like, this is just, I don't know why he did that and, he, and, and she didn't do this. And it's, just, it's just not fair. How many, times we do, how many times do we hear that? Not just talking, just, just church circles. It, it, takes, it takes one phrase, one, one word from someone in your own family. And it's just, it's just, that's just not fair, mom. <laughs> Somebody at work doesn't bow to your wishes at your, at your request, and, and what? And it's just muttering, it's just grumbling, complaining. What the Apostle Paul is, is actually saying is this. If you want to live on mission, on task, you want to fulfill your purpose, yes. If you want to live your life to have impact, if you want to be obedient to what Scripture says and work out your salvation, if you want to show others what the work of God looks like in your own life, you want to please God and bring pleasure to God, to your heavenly Father, 
You are to shine as a bright light in a dark world. And guard your tongue. Guard your tongue. My, my mom and dad would, would say something like this. Now, now, if you say that, Tim, I'm going to wash your mouth out with soap. I mean, we'd hear that today and be like, oh my goodness, call the hotline. They're washing the kid's mouth out with soap. And I, re I remember, I remember the first time my mom says, you say that, I'm going to wash. I'm like, my mom, like mom's really going, how, you, how does this even work? Let me tell you how it works, okay? Because she did it. Matter of fact, in our home, we were not allowed to refer to our mother as she or her, ever. It was disrespectful. We referred to her as mom, mother. She and her pronouns for your mom, who you were to our respect, was, was disrespectful. And I, I remember some, I don't know what I said, believe it or not, I said something I shouldn't have, and mom literally marched me into the bathroom, and it was dial soap. It was that green and she, she, she put water on it, and like soap it out, open your mouth. And she put the dial soap in my, and then she said, you wait right there, I'm going to time it. I, I tell you what you learn, I tell you what you learn, is what mom says, you better not say that the next time, because I'm going to, you learn. There were, there, were bubble, there were bubbles coming out. And the tears made more bubbles. That's, that's really what we're talking about. This is, this, is, this is how it all happens. This is the first of three that we're looking at. In staff meetings on Wednesday, we meet at 9.30 for the pastors and through our office manager. And we've been reading the book of James. Um, each, each week, we've been reading chapters. And, and we were reminded just recently in James chapter 1, it says this in verse 19, to be slow to speak. Isn't that interesting that we're to be slow to speak? And James does a marvelous job of using word pictures that help us understand. And he talks about the idea that the tongue is, is like, it's, it's just a little tiny thing. And yet that little tiny tongue can cause big problems. In fact, James actually says this in James chapter 3. We read it just this past Wednesday. How, how great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. How, how true is that? The tongue literally marriages, marriages. People have gotten divorced over words that have been spoken. Marriages have broken up. Families, families have literally been torn apart. Churches have split. Countries have gone to war because of words that were spoken. But James also talks about the fact that what? There can also be little things, little tiny things that bring great blessing. He says it's just a little tiny bit, this big, little piece of metal, about four and a half inches. That can steer what? A 2,000 pound horse. It's a little tiny rudder on the back of a ship that literally steers an entire ship. Little things, just like a little tongue, can actually serve to be an incredible blessing that edifies, that builds up, that encourages. Just a little tongue when you stop whining over it's not fair for you and start what encouraging others what is the result here literally continues you may be blameless and innocent children of god without blemish that's a, that's a pretty neat description that's that's the person it's the man that's the husband the father the grandfather the brother the son the pastor that that, that I want to be. And I don't have the ability to do it myself, but God gives me the power and the ability to be obedient, to be blameless and innocent and without blemish. My prayer for this church is that we would be known in this community that God has called us 
to be people what? They don't, they don't bite on one another. They don't spit at. They don't talk down. They don't cut. They don't criticize. They don't attack. No, but we, we would strive to be this type of church. Why? Because blamelessness and innocence, being without blemish, stands out so brightly in the midst, literally what it says, of a crooked and a twisted. Another translation says a perverse generation. I will not pause and elaborate. You can read and understand all over. That's a pretty accurate description of what our world looks like. But thus, how clear how evident it is for us when we choose to live differently. Allowing what? As we work out, God works in. We're guarding our tongues and we're using our words to build up and edify. And it's, it says literally, you will shine as bright lights in the world. Isn't it interesting? Isn't it interesting that the Lord Jesus Christ himself taught us, and I'll leave you with these words. He says in Matthew chapter 5, you, you, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ at Big Woods Bible Church, you are the light of Lock Haven, Pennsylvania, and Mill Hall. You're the light of Woolrich and Lamar and Belfont, Williamsburg. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to the whole house in the same way. Here it is. Here it is in the exact same way. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works. There's work that's involved here. Not for salvation, but because of salvation. The world may see your good works, what? And give glory to your Father who is in heaven. He will receive, he will receive all, all glory. We, we know what's going to happen. We know that day is going to come. So let's prepare now. Be submissive and obedient. Trust God. We don't sit here with arms folded. We don't work, 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 trying to. We can't, we can't. There's a glorious balance that's given to us in the truth of the Scripture and the work of the Holy Spirit so that every single one of us are beaming beacons of hope and grace and love. We have received forgiveness from our sin through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he has, what? He has allowed us to live and walk in the newness of life as a result of his resurrection. We, we have been given an opportunity in these next couple weeks to shine brighter than ever. A world that is completely confused as far as what Christmas is. That we can be faithful and obedient and show them and build up and edify others. Inviting them, telling them, giving God the glory. May that be our, may that be our our calling over the next couple weeks and then over the next, what, months and years to follow. We would be bright lights in a dark world for his glory. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your patience with us. Thank you for your word that speaks. God, we ask right now that your Holy Spirit would empower us to be obedient Lord, we know that there's areas that, that we fall short. We're well aware of that. We know, Lord, in our flesh, and, and I certainly confess, I can murmur and whisper under breath and complain, and, and God, forgive me, forgive us of that. And God, through your power, as you set us apart to holiness, to live with purpose, to bring you great pleasure and joy, May you, may you do all the work. May we be faithful and may you receive all the glory. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen.